didn't get the memo already, this is email marketing with MailChimp, not SEO basics. Probably teach both, but I think I can only do one at a time. So, um, First of all, who is first time here at Bucking? Okay, that's what I kind of want to expect. And then, who just got here for the day? Anyone? No? Okay. Who's a small business owner here? I like to get my audience going on here to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Um, who currently uses email marketing? Okay, we're still getting about half the room going on. And last question, I swear for now, does anyone currently use MailChimp? Who currently uses MailChimp, what I said? Okay, so we're still going about half the room. We're getting 50% everywhere, pretty much. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I want to talk a little bit about email marketing. I find it a really power, powerful tool, even with social media being so prominent. I think it's really important part of your strategy. I'm literally going to walk through how I would make a newsletter on MailChimp. Um, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Um, I'll also be here around help there after the session, because I'm sure there will be a billion other questions. I'll be happy to help you with them. But I'll do my best to kind of walk through here. Um, the reason I like MailChimp a lot, first of all, because Safari can't find the server. That's not <laughs> the real reason I like MailChimp a lot. Um, because of the pricing of MailChimp. It's free for up to 2,000 users. So you can have 2,000 people on your list for free. Um, and it's a super, super powerful tool to be able to build an email newsletter in that's really drag and drop for the most basic thing that can also be super powerful. Um, their plans to then get kind of pricey, and that's a, a negative I certainly see on them. So I am going to log in here. Go and try and copy my password, even though you're not going to be able to see any of them. I'm going to go to my Pittsburgh TweetUp account. Because I, I don't know if there's any corporate spies in here, so I don't want to use my work account, my real work account. Um, so what you're seeing here is a dashboard of what has happened on the Pittsburgh TweetUp newsletter, but I'm going to kind of skip and go back to the more basic stuff, so don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to go as if I were to start a new campaign on the left-hand side here. And um, in the upper right-hand corner here, you see Create Campaign, but all the other things you see here are the campaigns that we've previously sent. So we send pretty regularly, and a lot of people are actually opening them here. So 27% open, so that's kind of low, 35%. These are actually, believe it or not, really high for an email marketing campaign to be open. So Pittsburgh TweetUp, if you're unfamiliar, is a community meetup group. So we're not selling anything and we're completely nonprofit. So people are typically more engaged, they're more interested to read about it. Whereas if I'm selling you a product, they're probably not as apt to open the email. Um, so these are actually really, really good open rates. Uh, and the click rates are pretty up there as well, as you can see. Uh, and it certainly obviously depends on when you're sending in the month. There's so many different factors, and um, we can get into that later. Um, so I'm going to go in here and create a brand new campaign. And it gives you a lot of options at the beginning. It's kind of intimidating. Um, so you have a regular old campaign, plain text campaign, AB split campaign, RSS driven campaign. Um, it tells you underneath them what each of them are, which is another thing that I really like about MailChimp. They make it super straightforward on how to use it. Um, basically, I never send a plain text campaign, ever. Um, AB split, split campaigns are fun to test things out. You're literally able to test different subject lines and things like that. Um, and then RSS driven campaigns are something that you might want to use if you have a blog and you want to send auto things out. I don't necessarily suggest that. So I pretty much always stick with regular old campaign. So we're going to go there. And you're going to come up with some more options. We only have one list on the Pittsburgh TweetUp account, but you can stake and have a ton of different lists based on where they sign up at or if you want just one for events. or Hey, you can go crazy with it. Um, for example, for Skin Nourishment the Company that I work for full time, we have a list for event updates. We have our main newsletter. We have one for wholesalers. We have one for distributors. So we have a bunch of different lists going on there. So I'm going to 
then just send to the entire list. You can go to segments and stuff, but I don't want to get too complicated here. And inside here, now we have name your campaign, email subject, the from name, from address, total ton of other options going on here. So name your campaign is something internal just for you. Um, email subject is super important. That's something that I would focus your time on. I heard someone earlier today when talking about writing a blog to just come up with like 25 different names. And I wish I could tell you who said that, but I don't remember. Um, Patty. Patty? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a really smart comment, and it's totally true with email subjects. You're going to find that you need to just kind of find what's best for your customers or the people you're sending to. With skin nourishment, it's a lot better when we send November newsletter and then something about what's in the newsletter. For Pittsburgh Tweet Up, it's a lot better when we say, join us Friday at the event or something like that. Sometimes people really like the in-your-face, 20% off kind of thing, but that tends to be really spammy um, and probably not what you want to push in your newsletter because you want them to be there for the long term. You don't want them to just be there for that 20% discount at one time. Um, so name your campaign. I'm just going to put A, this is podcast in here. The email subject, I'm going to put... Join us at PodCamp. I don't even know the date. November 22nd? Today? Okay, good. I know my date better than I thought. Um, from name is also super important as well. It's not something you're going to change like your email subject all the time. Um, so for Pittsburgh Tweet Up, it literally just says PGH Tweet Up. But for skin nourishment, we have it look like it's coming from the CEO. And it does actually come from the CEO's email address. And she does write the content for it, so it's not something that's misleading. But you want to kind of bring your own personality into it as much as you feel comfortable with that. Uh, it could just be your generic company name if you kind of want to detach yourself from the company. But um, I would recommend something a little more personal. Uh, and then the last thing is the from email address. So we don't have a generic Pittsburgh tweet up email address. Uh, if we did, like, an info at is probably what would be best for it to come from. That's where it comes from with our uh, skin nourishment. A bunch of other options in here. Use conversation <coughs> to manage replies. Only available for paid accounts, but you'll find out when you send email campaigns, you'll get replies that are, like, auto responses, things like that. Um, personalize the to field. So it's really interesting when collecting email addresses. You think about just collecting an email, but... It's kind of super important to get someone's first name, at least. You can get, as a small business, their first name, their zip code, and their email address. You're pretty darn golden. With zip code, you find out where they are in the country. If you're a small local business, you find out where they are in the community. You find out where you're targeting to better. Um, and the name field, do you prefer when an email says, hey, Will? come and spend time with us, or hey, come and spend time with us? I mean, the answer is pretty obvious there. Um, so what this field allows you to do is say, hey, insert their name by basically a personalization field, which they have what they call merge tags. Um, they have good guides in there to other things you can use. Like if you did want to mention their zip code or whatever, it's not something you would mention, but you can put last names, you can send birthdays. There's lots of other more complicated things you can get into. Um, so I just scroll down here, track opens. Obviously, you want to do that. You want to see how many people open your campaign. The way that's done is a little image file inside there. Um, track clicks. It's required on free accounts anyway, but I don't see any reason you wouldn't want to track how many people are clicking the links inside your email. Um, track plain text clicks. Don't see any reason you wouldn't want to track that either. This is a weird thing about um, email marketing. Um, most people are using what's called HTML-based emails. That means like you're seeing images that can kind of get fancy. Um, whereas plain text emails are literally just plain text. Like the only thing you can really do to stylize it is bold, basically, and underline. They're super boring, but they still happen. And some people swear by them, so you should 
give your email a quick check over and make sure that it's going to look good in plain text too. Um, but tracking plain text links, it replaces the links with a URL that's unique. Um, rather than seeing, like, if we're linking to podcamppittsburgh.com, it would link to, like, mailchimp.com slash and then some random set of numbers. Um, E-commerce 360 link tracking. So this is something that is really, really powerful if you're selling something. So for skin nourishment, since we are selling something, we can see literally how many people have come from our email newsletter and how much money they've spent. <coughs> Click tail tracking, that gets a little more complicated. It literally tracks the way you click on the email, where you're clicking, and uh, then when you get to the website, it tracks it even further. If I keep telling you about that, you might be a little bit creeped out. The more people I tell about analytics on side of websites, they get kind of creeped out. Um, the last thing here, social media options, auto tweet campaign, auto post to Facebook, gives you options there. I always do it. I don't know if it's a big deal or not. I like to share it on social media to try and encourage people to say, hey, we do have this email newsletter and we are sending it out and you can see it right here, but you can also subscribe because it allows that option. Last things, auto-convert video and authenticate campaign. Um, authenticating campaigns is important because email services like Gmail um, look and say, hey, this is coming from Pittsburgh TweetUp. Is this really from Pittsburgh TweetUp? Or is this from someone trying to pretend to be Pittsburgh TweetUp? Any questions so far? Good? Okay. Go next here. This is where we get into the actual fun step of it. So, another thing that I said I really liked about MailChimp was it's really easy to design an email newsletter. You have a billion options, themes, coding. You can go back to recently sent. Um, so you can see, like, columns here. The awesome thing is the majority of this is drag and drop. Who doesn't love drag and drop? So, um, they even have themes here. I'm not a big fan of themes. They can be fun, but I feel like they end up being tacky. Um, if you do end up making something that you would be, like, your template. So for Pittsburgh TweetUp, we're constantly sending a really similar email, which is what I'm going to go into and show you. And then I'll backtrack here. So, recently sent. I'm going to open it up here. Select this. And it literally is going to auto-fill this with everything we sent the last time. So I'm going to go here first, and I'm going to go back. Um, so you can literally see the exact email that we sent here um, for Maggie's Farmhouse Rum just uh, not too long ago. So we have the logo, an introduction, a little... Blurb. And we actually have a little Jagoff plug here at the bottom. You can scroll down here. You see that we're linking to our Facebook, Twitter, our own website, and, and back to our email. We have our exciting social share buttons over here. Little sidebar with RSVPing, directions, the location. I did miss the uh, date and time. That might be important. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds important to you, but um, that's what happens when you don't pay attention or you send emails in five or so minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go back here now and go from a little layout. <laughs> so I, should I give you credit for what I literally just said directly at you, Bobby? <laughs> and for designing that template, redesigning it, rather? So I'm going back here to just get back to where we were to show you. Okay, so I'm just going to go with right sidebar again. That's the exact same one we were just using. But as you can see, there's a billion different options here that you could literally customize to all heck and back. So one column, one column banded that uh, has a little band of focus things on it one by two columns, so it's one column at the top, two at the bottom, one by two banded again, two column, two column, one by three, one by three. I don't want to go through all of them. So, I'm going to go with right sidebar. And it's going to refill with the stuff, which I don't want. So I guess I'm not going to do that. I have to exit back out.
goal was to have the empty thing, but since MailChimp is way too intuitive, it wants you to um, use the content you just had so you aren't losing it, which is convenient when you don't want to lose things, but not when you're trying to show people from scratch. So. Okay, now we have an empty template. So you can see it is literally drag and drop. A spot for an image at the top, that's where I put our logo. A spot for an image here, that's where I put this place that we're going. Text on the side and stuff here. So, does anyone have a random business here that I should start designing this for? Because I don't want to do it for Pittsburgh Tweetup again. But does anyone want to throw something out there? And I'll start randomly. I could just do a coffee shop, but... I'm going to do some sessions with Pittsburgh bloggers. Pittsburgh bloggers, mm -hmm. but it's a good one. I was trying to go towards more of a small business, but I love Boston. I like there it. I like yeah. it. Um, I am a big fan of Bocktown, so that's reasonable. So we'll give uh, we'll give Chris from Bocktown a shout out here. Um, so I'm gonna grab her logo to put in there. I don't want to spend time doing that, but on the right hand side, kind of small, but you can see here that you have a lot of different options for things that you can literally drag over there and drop in. So you have text. That's what this section is here, obviously. You have box text. It puts a little focus around it, so it's good if you're making an offer of some kind to kind of focus on. Uh, you have a divider here. Nothing too excited. Just an image, a group of images, or an image card, which has a caption below, but it's going to focus around it. Image with caption. Social share buttons, social follow buttons, just a button, a footer, and a code. Um, so the interesting thing, this bottom part here, it's really small, but it's stuff that is literally auto-filled for you based on what you gave them previously. So you have like copyright, the current year, the name of your company, so it's automatically saying copyright 2014, Bocktown Incorporated, all rights reserved, and it is not Bocktown Incorporated, it's run other some of the corporation, but that's not. <coughs> and then there you have an archive page, so you can literally, if you hit that, you're able to see all the other email campaigns that were sent out, and then the list description. The other part that gets really important is it has your mailing address there, so it does ask you for your address when you sign up for MailChimp, so be aware that it's giving that out. You can backtrack and kind of say, hey, just Pittsburgh, PA, in your zip code, and that's acceptable. Um, if you have a business here, obviously you're going to be a lot more protected with if it's different from a home business, but just that's something to think about. Um, and then the most important thing legally is the unsubscribe button down there, update subscription preferences. So as much as you don't want to see people unsubscribe from your newsletter, here's the way I like to think of it unsubscribing from their newsletter, they're telling you that either one, they're not interested, which is okay. Not everyone has to be interested in what you're doing. Or number two, they're not reading it, so you're not getting anything from it anyway. So why would it matter that they're unsubscribing? Um, I just sent our, our newsletter for skin nourishment today, and I always get like the unsubscribe emails, and I sit there and I look at them, and I'm like, oh, this one person didn't like this or whatever reason. I, I, you know, you kind of you want to know why, but... Um, you have to focus on the fact that there's all these other people that are reading it and focus on it for them. So I'm going to drop an image in here. I'm just going to drop... I guess we're going to have to go with a Burgatory logo because that's what I have handy here other than grabbing the Bocktown one. I don't think Chris would. I don't, yeah, I don't think she would either, especially after giving her that nice shout out too. If I was super prepared, I would have had like all Bocktown up here, but that might be like promoting business too much. I already like gave Mailchimp the whole like session, so um, it's cool because you get the, the the preview header image up there, so it doesn't actually have to be a logo. If you got something cool going on, like this Burger Tree Burger, kind of looks delicious. Bocktown's way better burgers. <laughs> Maybe a fries at least. Yeah, yeah. Not a burger person really. Um, so I'm going to put some things in here. We're going to say, I know that 
Chris is going to kill me for having the Bogtown logo up there, but we'll focus on the fact that I'm going to promote the Cakes and Eggs event. Every uh, year, Black Friday morning, 8 a.m., she does Cakes and Eggs, and you have Cakes of Beer and Eggs to start off your Black Friday shopping. So why wouldn't you want to promote that in Because most people start at like 4 o'clock in the morning. I mean, with Target opening at 6 on Thanksgiving, that's kind of like you're you're going to eat that before you go to sleep, I guess. I, I don't know at this point, but um, I'm not here to judge on that fact. So on the right-hand side here, I am going to quickly find a cake. Normally, if I was finding an image, what I would actually do, I want to talk you through it. That's a good one. Um, what I would actually do is I would go to something like Flickr, and I would search under Creative Commons, and I would, if I was using it commercially, say that I can adapt it commercially, and you would give credit there, because what I just did is literally just steal an image that someone had. Not the right thing to do. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Okay, so we got our keg there. So I'm going to show you what I would do on Flickr here if I was doing that. There's lots of other photo photography sites that you can do this on. There's plenty of stock photography sites you can get $5 images on in a quick second you need. Nothing really specific I would suggest. There's a billion of them. Um, obviously, I'd prefer in the end that if I had a business to just snap a quick picture of our keg at our restaurant, we're good to go. I don't have to worry about it. But if we are using Flickr, we have to go to this search up here. We have to get to advanced search, which I don't even see the thing for anymore, so that's great. Um, but I'm going to type in here keg. See how it has Creative Commons, it has commercial use allowed or modifications allowed. So more than likely, if you're sending a newsletter, you need it for commercial use. So we're going to switch that to commercial use, and it's going to reload here. Now we still have plenty of images. Important thing to remember here, still, we need to give Kevin, no, Kevin favor. How, how does Flickr filter that those images are actually commercially Good question. So when someone uploads something on Flickr, they have to give it a license. They have to say, hey, everyone can use this, or hey, it's all mine. What and there's a thing in, in between. Then that would be a Flickr problem yeah. that would go back on Flickr when it came but to you. They basically. have some kind of filter, too. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, you would think logically, like, YouTube takes, photo, takes videos and scans them for copyrighted content. Flickr probably does something similar, but not as aggressive. Yeah. Because if you think about the number of places a photo is posted, but obviously there's much stricter filters for things that should not be there and that yeah. are super illegal versus so it's things that are Yahoo. It's on yeah. Exactly. I mean, so it's it's really interesting because you see a lot of photographers and bloggers in a poor position all this time because their content is literally just stolen from them. Whether it's a site just taking it, posting it literally, or whether it is really, really ill-intentioned and it's like a personal person like me saying, hey, this is mine, but I didn't really police it at all. Um, so it's a really tough thing to police and it's certainly much more large of a problem than even one session can go through. We had a, a legal session actually I talked about it a little bit. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah I was just thinking, do you ever use, like, I know some bloggers and, and people who are use and stuff to, like, get the images or to try to... Start yes, to absolutely, start. absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of stock images, especially when it's a, a business that's earning money, where Pittsburgh TweetUp is not. So I'm going and either grabbing a photo and giving the community the site, <coughs> the... What word am I looking for? credit. Um, whereas if I'm a business, I definitely would go and pay like five bucks. It's super cheap to buy a good image if you need it. Whatever it is in a splash, whether it's a little truck 
or whether you need a really awesome ski photo. Um, but when it's something more community-based, like Pittsburgh Tweet Up, I want to do everything I can to involve the community. So when it's with a business, like if I was doing Bachtown, I'd be like, hey, Chris, what images do you have that I can use? And then she'll say, here's some awesome images to use that'll promote my business well. Um, but, you know, obviously if you're launching a product, then maybe it might be best if you take your own pictures of them. Um, so in doing this, we do need to give credit. We need to give a link back to this photo as well. So what we would do is we would literally take this link here and say photo credit to Cambridge Brewing Company. So we would say photo, photo credit Cambridge. And then we would link this right here. You can see how it can link. It's literally like the WYSIWYG editor that's super easy to use. And then we would link that directly to that image, making sure that those guys get credit. So, we're going to go here. We're going to say join us for kegs and eggs. Oh, no. Oh, yes. There you go. Feel a lot better about it now? I do. Okay. Thank you. Um, as you can see up here, just like Word, you can change your sizing. Something maybe a little more appropriate that would fit. It obviously suggests sizing, but as you go through here, if you want a second little byline here, we might put the date here. So I should know the date of Black Friday here, but I don't. So someone tell me the date of Black Friday. It's 28. 28. 28. Final answer. Okay. Okay. Uh, 28 and 1 fourth. I'm going to go with uh, November 28th, 8 a.m. That way I'm highlighting the time right there. And on our site, we might have something else that we want to link to here. So maybe we have an RSVP page where we need to know that people are coming. So that's what I'm going to go with. I don't think there is an RSVP page, but my, I have an ulterior motive here that I'll get to. So I'm going to type some really awesome text here that's super interesting about this event. This is an amazing event, and you should join us. You should probably come up with something a little better than that, I hope. But I'm going to leave the content part up to you. Um, but anyone have a guess of what I'm alluding to here of what you really should be doing with your newsletter here. Like, what, what do you want to happen when someone opens your newsletter? You want to go to their site? You want, you want to go to the site? So, so what? Buy, your product. buy a product. So you want them to do something. Like, there's, there needs to be a call to action. So, like, here right now I have join us for cakes and eggs, and here's the date, and, that, and, you know, told us why this event is so awesome, and you can come and drink beer, and, you know, have breakfast. And I, I link to this other brewery, and like, what are they going to do? They're going to be like, what, are they going to print this email out and be like, oh yeah, now I can go to this event. This is super awesome. Um, so you might want to link to a calendar event, or even better, if you have an Eventbrite page that you're RSVPing to. So we need to have some kind of call to action in your newsletter. So there's this awesome thing here in the lower left that is literally button. It is the best thing ever. So it literally fills it with make your purchase, but in this way I'm going to say RSVP, and you can put a link here, I don't have a link. But this way you are literally saying, go do this now. We've done our email newsletter, now I need you to do this action to continue on. So, we can add maybe our share button here and say, hey, we can share this with friends, perhaps. You can see here it's literally, as I said, 13 times already. It's drag and drop. Left hand side here, I'm dragging it anywhere I want on this page. If I want it there, going to settings here and align in different ways. But I like it down below here. And I'm going to add in some text here that says, bring a friend. So it's a second call to action. I even add a little divider in here to split it up. 
Now I'm getting into a little sticky situation because we got all this white space here. What are we going to do with all that? So you always got to think about what you're going to see when you look at the newsletter. So our, you have two different ways people are viewing it. Their computer and their phone. Probably a lot of people are viewing it on their phone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put the follow buttons over here now on this little corner. There we go. And you have a bunch more buttons you can add here, like literally every service under the sun. I'm just going to stick with what they put in there. So I'm going to go ahead forward here unless anyone has any questions on that part. Of it. Okay. Jack, can you put a, um, an email address instead of a link for that RSVP? You could definitely put an email address. I would definitely suggest using something like Eventbrite to easily collect that information. It's for free events, it's free to use. Rather than email RSVPs tend to not be received very well unless it's something that's like super private event. So like I got an invite to something that's invite only. I RSVP via email, but if I'm going to PodCamp or any other conference, this way you're kind of showing the world, hey, I'm going to this event. So you can use Facebook events, you can use Eventbrite, which is free for free events. Facebook is obviously free for free events, but you have to have a Facebook account, you can use Google Plus. There's an endless amount of services. <coughs> Eventbrite is a super easy one to use. Question over there. Yeah, I had a question about um, how do you how do you personalize content? Because I notice there are some that I'm subscribed to, yeah. where it'll start out the email, yeah. hi Kristen, yeah. and, and I have no clue how to do that. Yes, perfect answer, or perfect question here. So you remember how I was saying in the beginning how the top part says this is to Kristen? Right, so that's, so we that's can do, the email address. Yeah, we can, no, it's actually, if we do it right, and we have your name, it's going to have at the top, so like it'll say from Will, or from Pittsburgh Tweetup, and in the top part where it has two in your email address, it'll have your name too. But you can go even further, and I think this is what you're going for. So you can be like, hey, to find the right spot. There's a, there we go, that's the one I want. So see how I have tags here? It just says merge tag. Yeah. And then you can go first name. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So obviously. It's harder to find. Yeah. If you if you um, don't have that information, there's going to be nothing there. So that's another thing you have to think about. So if you're saying, hey, comma, you know, if you don't have their name, it's not going to be there. At the same time, you both have to ask every other word. But you're allowed to put in a um, like a, a fallback. Yes. Yes. You can. So, so you say hate person. Not make sense. You have to think of a good call. But like the fallback that they have is that they suggest for you is often customer, which is like the worst thing. I usually, <laughs> I usually put hey friends or hey, hey fellow dancers. Hey, you, or, hey awesome person. Yeah, that's awesome. So you can put like, how do you notate that though? Uh, I don't know. So up here, see how it has open cheat sheet? Okay. We're going to do a little more advanced stuff here. So you have all these different merge tags you can use. Like, you get way more complicated than the first name. But, on the first name one, here we go. I was hoping for a link right there of, I was hoping for a link right there of, like, because in all of these, you're going to be able to get more complicated than just first name. It's going to be something like percent fallback. Um, I would literally just suggest Googling, but I don't want to take up time for that there. I will look later here to find it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead forward here. You have all these other kind of things you can personalize, colors, things like that. But I want to show you some analytics data. Fun stuff. How do you view your finished email to what it's going to look like on a phone or a tablet or a PC or a uh, television screen? Yeah. 
So up here you have this preview and test. So inside that preview and test, it'll allow you to send the email to yourself, so you can see it, or any other email address. It also allows you to preview it on a phone screen, and just generally. My rule for that is, I, pre I send it to myself, I try and send it to one other person to look over, and um, then I preview it on the phone screen as well. You also want to make sure you test your links. Always test your links. Um, so you have a bunch of other things here. You can schedule your email. It's great. But I am going to go back to some analytics and more stuff. said here, we have this data here about subscribers, so this is the number of subscribers each time on the list. So we went up here, dropped one. Percent of people opening it, percent of clicks. So inside these actually, so we're going to look at this specific email of Maggie's Farmhouse Rum. And literally, this is the email that we viewed before. Saw this before to start out. And we're going to see exactly what people click, where they click, blah, 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 blah. So we talked about open rate already. We talked about click rate already. Here's some important numbers for you to look at for you. Your list average, so 36% <coughs> for the list average, wonderful. This one was a little bit lower, so wonder why people are not opening this email as often. Probably, just a really educated guess here. This tweet up was literally, this, it was sent the same day as the event. So I want to get a little more lead time than that. Um, <laughs> going to look at industry average. So this is online community and social networks. So we're actually doing really good in comparison to what other people are getting in this kind of industry. Click rate, not so good, 1.4%. Again, we sent it the same day that it happened. Probably a pretty good reason. List average, industry average again. So the number of people who opened it, 39 of the 144. Two people clicked of the 39 who opened it. And two people bounced. Anyone know what bounce means? It wasn't taken almost immediately after a writer left. Close. It wasn't taken notice immediately. Yeah. You were going for website I'm going bounces. SEO. Sorry. Yeah. The, this, the SEO session is tomorrow, same room, 1 p.m. though. Um, I have a question for you. Yes. What if you, right after you send that, uh, what if you enter 20 more names on your list? If you've already sent it, yeah. then... And is that going to drop your open rate because you have more on your list now than you did when you sent it? No, no. It's smart enough to know that you sent it with this many people, basically. But those 20 people are not going to get it unless you go through, and this is an interesting place where you could segment the people. So you could say people who have been added to the list after this time period. So here's a really interesting situation that we had. Um, we had an employee at our company actually steal customer data. And we needed to tell a bunch of customers within a certain period of time that their data was stolen and here's what you do, blah, blah, blah. So we literally went in and we said, customers between this date and this date receive this email. No one else does. You could also use it for only certain people in this region get it or only certain people in this group get it. So you can start segmenting a bunch of different ways. If you click on the hot link behind the two click-throughs, can you see the person's name just click You can. You can. Yeah. So we'll go there. Um, this is, might get a little creepy. Um, so I'm going to go to the bounce first here. So these two people bounce because their emails were wrong or they don't exist anymore or... Their box was full. Their box was full. <coughs> There's a billion different reasons. Bounce. And actually, I know this person personally, so I'm going to go find them and hunt them down. <laughs> um, so we see a ton of information here. Links. So these are all the links that were inside the email. So there were a lot of links inside there. You had the Jagoff dictionary, 
and you had someone click on the Google Maps link. But there were all kinds of other links inside there that people could have clicked on as well. I have a question. Sure. Um, you know how we're excessively copying your email, which I don't see there, but if you have trouble seeing this, you can see it as a web page? Yes. Suppose you take that web page address and you tweet it. And then people are clicking on your newsletter, not because they're on, in your list, but because they're clicking on it through the web page link. Is that counted as part of the analytics? That is not counted as part of the main analytics, but you can still see that data information sort what they call as the social here, actually. So what happens when they tweet it for you, like when you saw the auto-tweet campaign as on Twitter and auto-posts on Facebook, that is literally what they're doing for you. They're just taking the link and doing it for you. Okay, so if you have a 30% open rate, that is truly from your email list. That is not bolstered up because people are opening it through the web link. Right. Okay. You can see that separately, and that would be something that you would see right here. So if we did share it on Facebook and it did get clicks, it would be here. And it also should geographic data. E-commerce, that is self-explanatory. If you had sales going through it, they would show. Hey, well, yeah. Just going back to the question she had earlier, isn't there a way, <clears throat> I thought there was a trigger that if you sent the email and then you added other people underneath of it, and you resend it, it says to re, isn't there a button that you click that just says resend to those who had not received it yet? Yes, there is. And so... Far be it for me to challenge you on anything technology, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I've actually used that in the past. Yeah, if you, so what happens is if you go ahead on MailChimp and you're adding these email addresses manually, it is smart enough to know that hey, you just added a bunch of people and you just sent the campaign. But if for some reason like your Jagoff partition goes crazy and you get a bunch of email subscriptions, it's not going to do it there. Hmm. Not that smart. Smart, but not that smart. Also going back to something she said. So if it, if you click on the view this in, in the web browser and send link, where, where did that go to? Would it say MailChimp at the front? It says MailChimp at the top, okay. yeah. So, I don't want to show all of this personal data, so I'm going to leave it up here. But it literally shows you exactly who opened it, how many times they open it, their first and last name. It shows you all of the information that you would have collected. Um, and you can see that for clicks, you can see that for unsubscribes, you can see that for... But that's information they provided you when they signed up. That is information they provided you. Correct. You can actually on MailChimp connect it to social data as well. It's an extra cost. It's handy if you really want to dive that deep into the analytics. So, this, uh, any, are there any email servers or email hosts that have some difficulty reading MailChimp? There was, when Gmail switched over um, to their new priority inbox type thing, that was a big kind of question because they were sorting kind of promotional emails out. But in terms of a specific like AOL or Gmail or something, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Well, I think of like the Microsoft um, web-based mail, um, which I use for work mostly. Sorry. Others, I'm sorry. Too. <laughs> um, You have to hit the thing that says, hey, download all this yeah. stuff for yeah. safety. Norm? Do you know what would cause mail servers to reject mail email from MailChimp? I have at least two clients where I have this problem, and it's, it's, it's at the server level, and it blocks MailChimp. Yeah, so there's, if you get blacklisted, that would not be a good thing, obviously. Um, the thing that I would look it's into... Not a I definitely know it's not a blacklist. Yeah, it would, it would probably be placed pretty blatant in that area. It Think might not be you that's blacklisted. It might be MailChimp. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, res, a receipt from MailChimp. This is the problem. But it's happening at the server level. What I would Let's, do is I would go into a little more diving deep program. I think it's called Mandrill. That is like transaction.
conventional email, and it literally shows you and dives a lot deeper into what is getting blocked and why, and efficiencies in getting email to them. And it can actually connect directly to MailChimp. Obviously an extra cost, but it allows you to see a lot more information. Yeah. It's a super powerful tool, and I really wish that I could look at a lot more analytics because there's, as you can see, a ton of different data that you can see to just continuously hone your email, but um, you have to manage your time. Yes? And then did you talk about SPF records? I did not. So, so that might be a way to avoid, um, so there's a thing when you register a domain name and the, like the records for the domain name, where you can tell people, tell, tell email servers that when they receive stuff, this is officially from me, even though it's not from me. That's, and so MailChimp has instructions on how to set that up for a particular domain name. And sometimes some really strict email providers check that, and that might be a reason on why they're being bound. Yeah, it's called sender policy file, and there's also DKIM authorization as well, um, both which are ways to further authenticate email campaigns um, for people. Where you make them? Um, do some, like, not bounce, but go to their Absolutely, yeah. So, how do you, how about, like, people that you they never unsubscribe, they don't know about your newsletter because yeah. they're never reading it? Yeah. I mean, there's so certainly people all the time where, um, where when you log in, you'll see, hey, they marked it as spam, and you might even know that person, or you might know that, hey, you can see exactly when they signed up and when, and obviously it wasn't spam. Right. spam. It's just something that you can't take personally. Um, if you feel comfortable, well, I don't sometimes. Mean that they and call them spam. I mean, yeah. that their email program is putting it in a spam folder in their email. And that's when you have to start looking at the content of your email newsletter specifically. Because if your content looks spammy, then that's when it's going to start hitting those filters. So if you're just sending one big image and that's all you're sending, that's going to throw up spam filters all over the place. Or if you use the word free in the subject line or something like that, you might end up in a spam filter. So is there some magical place out there where all these best practices are collected so that somebody like the one read them and learn that quickly? Yes, extra good question. MailChimp actually has an amazing guide. They have, when you literally sign up for MailChimp, they say, would you like to receive our like best tips and it's like 10 different emails and you can see them all at once if you want and they have an entire blog also dedicated to tips and tricks directly for using mail tips and tricks directly for using MailChimp as well. I wanted to show you one thing but I don't want to display customer data so I was trying to do it in a proper manner here as quickly as I could because we we're almost out of time. So I wanted to show you, um, which I know you cannot see my screen right now, I want to get to something here. Here we go. That you can see unsubscribe, and if you allow them to select a reason, or allow them to write in a reason, you can see that as well. interesting thing to look at because if people are unsubscribing from your list, you might want to know why. It's not something certainly to dwell on. But there's an interesting thing real quickly too. You can see literally which email client opened, bounced, clicks, unsubscribed as well. So that's where you can kind of identify perhaps issues 